Hello, and welcome to a Fluidform research highlight. I'm Andrew Hudson. I am both a co-founder in Fluidform and currently a graduate student in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Carnegie Mellon University. To go over the reasons for doing this research highlight series is two parts. The first is it gives a chance for research students, graduate students, postdocs, etc., to give more of a time to talk about their work and their contributions outside of the occasional conference that they go to maybe once or twice a year. The second is that we seek to provide a longer format series for researchers to talk about the methods that allow them to perform their research. I, as a graduate student, occasionally find it frustrating when a methods section is a little dry on details when you actually try and go to replicate them. So this whole series is giving them a chance to elongate the actual methods that they use to accomplish their work in order to also give them more credit. Our guests today, plural, are Dr. Molly Kupfer and Weihan Lin. Dr. Kupfer received her bachelor's degree in molecular biology from Pomona College in 2014 and her PhD in biomedical engineering from the University of Minnesota in 2019. Molly is currently a clinical product risk specialist for Boston Scientific. Weihan Lin received his bachelor's and master's degrees in chemical engineering from National Taiwan University in 2010 and 2012 respectively. He is currently a fifth year PhD student in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. Both Molly and Weihan were, or are, students advised by Dr. Brenda Ogle, who is the head of the Department of Biomedical Engineering at the University of Minnesota. Today, Molly and Weihan will be discussing their work on the paper, In Situ Expansion, Differentiation, and Electromechanical Coupling of Human Cardiac Muscle in a 3D Bioprinted Chambered Organoid, published in Circulation Research in March of 2020. Here are Dr. Molly Kupfer and Weihan Lin. All right. Dr. Molly Kupfer and almost Dr. Waihan Lin, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah so we're, we're here to talk today about your, your really interesting paper in circulation research. Um, just either either one of you, can you really briefly just give a really quick like two to three sentence overview of the of the paper? I know it's, it's obviously not doing it justice in, in that short amount of time, um, but would either one of you like to tackle that? Um, sure, yeah, I can do that. Um, so the idea of this paper was we 3D printed a functioning cardiac muscle pump, essentially. Um, and we did that by using a bioink made of extracellular matrix proteins. And we printed with human pluripotent stem cells and differentiated them in the structure. And it was based on um, a MRI scan of the human heart, but sort of simplified in structure. And so the result was sort of this beating um, pump model that is capable of electrical connectivity and mechanical function and pump function. Awesome. Um, so obviously to, to get to actually having a 3D printed heart, um, you have to have a, a 3D printer. So can you just like describe your overall printer setup? I know that um, I think you have a selling incredible, um, what type of settings were you using, um, things you, you liked about it, things that were challenging? Yeah, so the printer we are using is an incredible plus print bioprinter. And it provides you a dual head pneumatic extrusion system and with a heating jacket for us to control the printing temperature. And I think we mentioned most of the printing parameters in the paper. Mm -hmm. But something I'd like to mention is that like in the paper, we say we were always using the pressure ranging from 28 to 38 kilopascal. But practically, we are using uh, the time between drops as an indicator for the pressure. I mean, so like we usually aim for like three seconds or 3.5 seconds between two different drops. And we're doing this because there's always a variation between the pressure that gives you the optimal printing condition or printing flow rate. I mean, I think the inconsistency could be due to the German quality or the cell aggregates in the bowing or something like that. So, yeah, that's what we are doing right now. So the, the majority of the difficulties printing were like, like some type of ink viscosity or blockage from cells as well as uh, like pressure fluctuations from what you're saying? Yeah, okay. and so because we are mixing, we are adding lots of like easy proteins and yeah, and also we are dissociating, we are adding lots of cells in the bowel ink and yeah, it's not very consistent, I would say. Gotcha. And you do, you do mention in the paper, um, prior to trying uh, fresh printing, you, you were coming up with this different type of printing method called in, inverted geometry filling. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, because when you're printing with cells, there's always, there's usually a common dilemma that you have to choose between printing resolution and cell availability. 
because if you want to increase your uh, printing resolution, then usually you will have to increase your ink viscosity, and which will require a higher printing pressure, and that may lower down the cell variability in your uh, printing structure. And but since we are here ring more about the cell behaviors. So we develop a very low viscosity belt ink based on all those ECM proteins. And so then we need to figure out a way to ensure and ensure us an acceptable power printing, I mean printing resolution. And at the very beginning we developed this method called inverted geometry refilling. And in which we created a negative mode with the heart, with the HHM template by printing with a Pronic F127 and fill it layer by layer uh, with uh, our bell ink. However, this is not a very easy method to print, uh, to create the heart. And so first, because there's always some structural defect happen during printing. And we have we have to pause the print and clean the defect and restart the print for each defect. So it's pretty time consuming. And also to maintain the resolution of the pronic structure, the printing speed cannot go very high. Like we were always using like below one millimeter per second. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it is it it took pretty long for print uh, like almost more than an hour. And yeah, and I mean, on top of these time issues, the system doesn't work pretty well for our stem cells proliferation and also for the following cardiac differentiation. I mean, so the cell growing, I mean, the cell proliferation was quite limited. And sometimes you can find beating clusters, but they never, they never, they will never become large enough to give you a uh, macro scale contract mm -hmm. of your contract structure. Yeah, and we thought one reason for this could be that the bio inert had to improve the chronic interfere with the, the interaction between cells and the bio ink. So we thought about changing to some other sacrificial materials uh, like LGNA or gelatin. Uh, we finally decided to give the fresh method a try. And yeah, I mean, actually we know, we had been discussing the fresh method for a while, and we thought this is a very interesting and smart method because then you can control the print resolution, resolution more by changing your slurry properties instead of uh, play around with your ink. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty smart. <laughs> and, yeah, but there were definitely some challenges uh, for transferring the process from the traditional printing to fresh printing, including like we need to optimize all the printing parameters. Mm. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and <laughs> and like for the surgery preparation, we need to modif modify the protocol from your paper because I mean, I think the Major difference would be the blender because we have a totally different blender and we cannot get <laughs> the one like you use in your paper. You're, you're mentioning adapting uh, Blended Fresh uh, to your protocols. Like, what specifically were you were you changing to actually uh, get it to work with without whatever blender you were using? Yeah, I think actually I don't remember pretty well uh, what kind of parameters you were using for your blender, but basically we. I mean, first we try to follow the same conditions you use for uh, the blender, but it didn't work pretty well. I mean, we keep getting particles larger than 500 micrometers or even like one millimeter per particles. And so we try to increase the, I mean, we put it wrong with the time length for the slow speed and the high speed blending. And I mean, I think we optimize the process a little bit and finally we found the condition that works the best for our system Got yeah it. yeah heat, heat generation from the blender was always a problem because you can't you'd like to blend indefinitely to get very small particle size but that's always a problem which uh we do use a different method to make particles in a, in a newer paper but um you were talking about not just uh 
optimizing like print settings, you also went through a pretty big litany of like an assay to try and actually develop like the perfect bio ink. Um, I, I was wondering if Molly could take over and and talk about all the different uh, assays you were doing to try and assess uh, how bio ink composition affects um, cell behavior. Yeah, for sure. So, well, really early on, the initial approach we took was one that I think a lot of labs have tried to take, which is to differentiate stem cells into cardiomyocytes and then to collect those cardiomyocytes and print with them. And so early on, what we found was that we weren't getting very much um, connectivity of cardiomyocytes. And the problem we were having is it's hard to get really the high enough density you need so that the cells are in contact with each other mm -hmm. in the structure. And because cardiomyocytes don't really proliferate or migrate once they're differentiated, wherever they are, that's kind of where they're going to stay. And if they can't reach each other, then you're not going to get the connectivity. So then we had the idea, what if we printed with stem cells, which are able to proliferate pretty robustly, and then differentiated them inside of the structure. And so we found that we were able to get that to work pretty well just in Gelma, but we wanted to, yeah, as you said, optimize a bio ink that would be better for differentiation and function. And our lab kind of has a history of studying the role of the extracellular matrix in modulating function and behavior and differentiation in cells of the heart. And so we did draw on some previous work on optimizing ECM, and we had a combination of a few proteins that we were using. And so we tried out some various combinations of these in different amounts. Um, for the sake of simplicity, we, and using less material for this particular optimization stage, we did it in a much smaller, less complex structure than what we ultimately ended up creating later in the paper. So essentially these were just millimeter scale disks, but we were able to, by doing that, compare all these different formulations and look at how are the cells proliferating over time prior to differentiation and how are they differentiating and then functioning in terms of contraction. Gotcha. And I think were the, the disks that you're doing these rapid iterations on, uh, were those casted? Yeah, the disks were um, essentially pipetted. It was a pretty small volume, so mm -hmm. you could just sort of pipette a droplet, it would flatten out, and then you could cross-link it. Yeah, so something that we that we know definitely is a thing with, with Fresh is you have this residual porosity from the gelatin that gets melted out. Do you think if you had printed those assay disks that you would have gotten different results? Or if casting it would have just been the same thing because it's really the proteins doing the work and not the porosity? I think the proteins are doing quite a bit of the work, but yes, I would... I don't think I would feel comfortable saying that it would be exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And I think since the study, maybe Wei Han and others in the lab have done a little bit of work in printing some more simple structures and things, and then differentiating them in them like disks versus the pump model that we did. Um, I do expect that the porosity makes a certain difference, but the fact that we were able to see the success in the one in the disks without as much porosity is a good sign because it shows that even without that porosity, they're still able to um, sort of remodel and differentiate and connect to each other. And then likewise with the more porous one, which would be the fresh printed, even with the porosity, you're not having issues with them connecting to each other. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so you also talked about uh, like expanding IPS cells and um, it was really, really intelligent to, to circumvent the problem of uh, how rapidly these cells can reproduce by actually just going with the stem cells first. Um, mm -hmm. but can you talk about how, how much faster you were able to actually iterate on your experiments by doing um, the stem cells uh, pre-differentiation instead of, and then having uh, the differentiation in situ? Yeah, so I think there's certainly um, a, a benefit in terms of efficiency. So, you know, with cardiac differentiation, of course, is kind of a, with like everything with stem cells, a little bit of a finicky process. Mm -hmm. And so, your output is, might vary from batch to batch. But even if, let's say, you have a really good differentiation, you have a lot of cardiomyocytes to work with, you know, those cells in the dish are connected to each other and they're depositing ECM. And so if you go to collect those cells and break them up, it can be pretty challenging. Often you would need a cell strainer. And so I think you would lose a lot of material in that process as well. And so the nice thing about the stem cells is that you can expand them to large numbers and you can more easily collect them. There's less of an issue with breaking them up. And then there's the other factor, which is that, you know, in the native heart and development, 
there's no stage at which you would be breaking up these cardiomyocytes. But to collect them from a dish, you kind of have to do that. And then you're relying on them to reform the connections again once you print them. So I think, yeah, the printing with the stem cells definitely in some ways was more efficient. Um, and we were able to pretty easily, I think when we were going pretty hard at this, we were trying to do around two of the pump models a week. And so just, you could usually do that even with just a couple plates mm -hmm. of very potent stem cells. If you culture them right, you passage them right, you can get pretty high densities. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And then, so you, you actually, you take these cells and then you're, you're printing them into the heart model. Can you talk about uh, the heart model, like where you got it, what you had to do to it, um, the cell density and all that stuff that's going on in, in the actual printing of the heart? Yeah. Um, so the model came from originally an MRI scan for human heart. And then there were some key modifications we made. And the first one is that we made it much smaller than a human heart. So scaled it closer to the size of a mouse heart. So mm -hmm. I think it was about... 1.3 centimeters in diameter. Um, in addition to that, um, as we know, the heart has all of these chambers and we wanted to have, be able to have a perfusible structure. And so we ended up basically creating a little septal deviation. Mm -hmm. And so it ended up having sort of a single closed loop that you could perfuse fluid through. So that was a bit of a simplification of the adult heart structure. And then we also simplified the vasculature structure a little bit. So we just had two primary large vessel structures coming out of the top sort of as an inlet and outlet. Um, and so that was the model we were printing based on. And then to prepare the cells, we were using a density of 15 million cells per milliliter of bioink. And I would say to print a single HCHAMP, I don't think we've actually said HCHAMP yet. That's what we were calling these pump models. <laughs> Can you explain the acronym real quick? Human Chambered Muscle Pump. Yes, H champ. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, to print those, it's usually around 700 microliters of ink, say. Mm -hmm. So really, you can get one, say, out of maybe a plate of stem cells. Um, and then, of course, you culture the stem cells within the structure. And so then their numbers are increasing over that period of time. Yeah, the, the proliferation rate within the structure was really impressive. I, I think... I. I can't remember off the top of my head, but I think it was at least fivefold. Um, I think you said 500%, where it went from 15 to, I can't remember how many millions, but it was way more than just doubling. Um, it was all over a 40 day plus period, but um, that was really interesting to see because it's normally difficult for something in a gelma uh, that's been uh, covalently linked for them to actually be able to at least spread through that system. So that was really, really neat to see. Yeah. Um, Part of it was the the concentration of the gelma. You know, we tried 15% and that seemed to be a little too high for them to proliferate. Mm -hmm. So part of it was that concentration. And then I think a big part of it is also, you know, what other proteins we're putting in there that the cells can attach to. And likely there are signals that are coming from those proteins that are impacting how they're behaving in multiple ways. Right. And so now you have this, this printed heart with stem cells in it. Um, how, how do you culture it? Um, flow, no flow? Um, like simple setup or like tilting and rocking versus actually hooking stuff up. Um, pulsation we know helps. Um, what, which type of culture system did you choose and why? Yeah, well, um, I think after this, Weihan can maybe talk a little bit about the perfusibility aspect. Mm -hmm. um, for this study, for the most part, we introduced perfusion or we introduced convection by rocking. Um, and we found it worked well to introduce that um, when the cells were differentiated, once they were differentiated in the cardiomyocytes. Um, but I definitely think that level of convection helped. I think um, we intentionally made a structure that could be perfused and we showed that it could be. And I think that um, will help improve it even more. Um, we already got some impressive results in terms of the cell density and sort of improving upon the thicknesses that people have been able to achieve. But certainly if you can improve the way you're getting media through that structure, you can get even more cell density on the inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so once you have this uh, contractile system, I guess, Wahan, do you want to talk about what you can actually do on this as a platform? I know you, you mentioned a lot about uh, drug discovery and drug testing. Um, can you talk about how this actually enables a lot of researchers to, to further study drug effects on, on cardiomyocytes in a way that's more advanced than just a 2D culture? Yeah, I mean, I would second what you said. I'll, you know, originally, the, the idea of an engineered heart tissue was a strip of tissue 
yeah. and you get force measurements, but it doesn't hold volume, it doesn't pump volume. So if you think about some of the clinical parameters we think about with hearts, for example, like ejection, fraction, stroke, volume, you can't get that from a, a cells in addition, you can't get it from a strip of tissue. So right. anything like this that can hold volume and pump volume really gets us a little bit closer to that. Mm -hmm. um, and it can be quite useful, I think, if you want to look into studying, for example, diseases that might manifest in altered pressure volume dynamics, it could be an interesting model for disease like that, where you can actually see um, what the impact is, what are the changes in the pressure and the volume that's being generated. Yeah, um, I think the at least the two drugs I have the paper on another monitor, we were using uh, verapamil and another one was isoproterenol. I hope I'm pronouncing both of those right. Um, yeah, but both are, it's really, it's gotta be really satisfying when you know that there's the unknown effect of a drug on a cell or a tissue, and then you see that in your model to at least mm -hmm. try to try in the right direction. Like that's, that's gotta be really, really rewarding. Um, but you, you're, you were kind of mentioning how these things don't really, uh, like 2D strips don't really replicate uh, complex 3D geometric tissues um, as well. Did you see any, I know this is beyond the scope of the paper, but did you see any quantitative or qualitative differences um, if you've been dealing with other types of 2D tissues that the 3D tissues were showing, were, was there more um, like fiber concentration or anything like that? Um, yeah, so, you know, we hadn't really, I think now we're moving into more using um, force measurements, mm -hmm. um, but from this, I don't really have a good comparator for force measurement um, between the different types of tissues, but I would say definitely I started to see once we did stuff in 3D, I started to see some more sarcomere alignment mm -hmm. um, than I had seen before in my earlier 2D differentiations. And it's hard to say to gauge the difference in terms of contractility, just because if you're looking at cells in a 2D dish, they're attached to the dish. Whereas if you're looking at a disc that's floating, it's moving in and out of plane a lot. And so it can definitely, it looks like it's moving more, but it's hard to gauge if it, you know, is it really moving more or is it just that it's not attached? Mm -hmm. Do you think that uh, the the printing process of uh, like layer by layer deposition, do you think that the, the needle drawing actually has an effect on <clears throat> uh, muscle cell alignment or cellular alignment to begin with, which is obviously very, very crucial for muscle cells to begin with? Yeah, I mean, uh, you definitely will see some alignment where the uh, print direction you use. And I think it's more uh, obvious with our more old method, which we deposited in layer by layer in the in a negative mode. But actually with fresh, uh, the surface would become pretty smooth compared to the traditional printing. So I don't think there's the uh, obvious uh, alignment. I mean, with the, the printing direction, zero so alignment with the printing direction. Gotcha. So when you're when you're trying to analyze these things, and you, you mentioned um, trying to get uh, pressure and, and volume dynamics out of this, how difficult is it to actually set up that that testing experiment? Because that just seems like something where this is why I, I really try to like hit upon this series is there's the methods of that where you say that you measured it with this setup versus actually doing it and and where you probably have to destroy like 20 hearts to actually learn how to use medical glue the right way um so can you go into like the, the the gritty details if you want to of like how do you actually get this thing in a system where you can reliably measure it no i like to start off in general we were in a situation where we had this model that we could test and we had resources we had access to collaborators who measured these kinds of things in actual native hearts and animals. And so it was really kind of a matter of adapting those systems to our sort of these 3D printed things that we had floating in a dish. Um, and so there were challenges there, but I mean, the people we worked with had a lot of expertise in it and they worked with us, which we're really grateful for. So you, you have a lot of stem cells in the structure and you've got them to differentiate in situ and you're getting these force measurements out of um, going forward with future research, what are things that you're trying to tackle in terms of like introduction of endothelial cells? I know that you had some endothelial cell differentiation um, in those tissues, but um, how would you try and say, for instance, try and introduce endothelial cells as a lining within these for a hypothetical implantation study in the, in the long term? Okay, so yeah, definitely. <laughs> um... If we introduce endothelial cells or vasculature uh, into our HM, then they, 
this will definitely enable a better nutrient perfusion and also support or maybe increase our tissue thickness. We have previously identified the optimized ECM composition for promoting cardiac differentiation. And now some other projects in our lab going on in our lab are focusing on how can we uh, use some different protein combinations and uh, to improve the endothelial differentiation and function. And ideally, we will be able to come incorporating multiple buildings uh, that optimize for different cell type, cell types, and then we can do a spatially control differentiation for both vascular structure and the cardiac muscle in our HN. And yeah, ideally. Do you think that uh, fibroblasts would play an important role in, in future, particularly cardiac or skeletal muscle cell uh, differentiation? Yeah, it has been shown by many researchers that fibroblasts plays a very important role for cardiac muscle connection and uh, electrical signal conduction and lots of things like that. And we are definitely exploring this uh, in the lab, but I, I, I just cannot talk too much. <laughs> okay. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I definitely think um, it would improve things. And as we discussed earlier, you know, it's hard just with the printing to get things to align in the way you want. And so you could think about fibroblasts as well as other signals that people have used to improve alignment and maturation in terms of electrical and mechanical stimulation and all these ways that adding these components could help improve the overall structure and alignment and maturation of our tissue as a whole. Um, and also, as we know, fibroblasts deposit a lot of extracellular matrix, and we have this sort of ECM-based model, and so it would be interesting to see how their inclusion impacts the ECM and how those changes then impact the behavior of the cardiomyocytes. Yeah, definitely. I think I know that from, from our experience, even just having anywhere between like 2 to 5% fibroblasts was immensely beneficial, so it would be really cool to see um, the effect that they could have on, on, on your guys' printing as well. Um, okay. You talked about the the difficulties of attaching these rat or these uh, these heart models to a, like a PV style loop system. Um, are there any other aspects of the paper that it may just be like only one sentence long in a method section, but actually took like weeks or months to learn how to do it properly that that you want to talk about for for other people who may uh, may already be having or may not even know that they're going to encounter problems. One of my suggestions is try just try to be cautious for every steps you did in the experiment. Like one time uh, when I were, was preparing for the printing, uh, when I transferred the celery from clinical tube to the printing chamber, I just have a feeling like this tube, uh, I just had a weird feeling. I mean, I cannot really tell if it's bone briskers or if it's just more sticky or something. Mm -hmm. But I just have a weird feeling there's something wrong. So I put it back, see if it's a backup. After a couple of days, I check the fridge again, and there's lots of fungus <laughs> in the tube. So, yeah. so I save our cells. So yeah. And speaking of fungus, what a segue. Um, you know, another thing to consider is sterility in general with the functional assessments. Well, that was something we were dealing with. Like, a lot of these systems that they had set up were not meant to be done in a sterile environment necessarily. Um, and so... That was certainly challenging for us, and in many cases, we tried to arrange our experiments such that the thing that was the least sterile would be the last thing we did before we fixed the tissue right. so that we could avoid getting contamination. But down the line, it's certainly something to consider, like what are the ways that we can make the environments in which we're doing this testing more amenable to the cells? Yeah, that's, that's definitely a challenge is whenever you think that, well, if I want to assess this, then I have to sacrifice it. And I want a high a high end for for stats, but it, like it just makes everything a little more more difficult. Um, and so I always like to to end these on a pretty open end question. And I, I guess I should have given you some more time to think about this, um, but it's one that I like to ask for anyone who's done significant bioprinting research, like you guys have, is if you were to go back in time and either tell yourself some advice or a new grad student who's maybe taking over your project or or getting into three D printing. What advice would you have for a student getting into 3D bioprinting to try and make them as successful as possible? I'm a little bit biased because I'm actually a biologist by training, but don't <laughs> don't discount the biology too much when you are focusing on the materials aspect. Because I think it can be pretty easy to sort of get carried away and 
generating like a bio ink that is really good structurally for the printing you're trying to do. But if the cells don't function well in it, then it kind of doesn't help you at all. Mm-hmm. And another aspect to that is there's more to cell function than just viability. I think yeah. in a lot of printing papers, they'll, where they're introducing an ink or a process, they'll just show, look, the cells are still viable. But, you know, the cells may have been viable in some of our less optimal inks, but they couldn't proliferate. And then we couldn't differentiate them and have them have that connectivity. So there's a lot of different aspects um, to that. And so you really have to be considering what the end goal of your tissue or whatever it is you're trying to make is and make sure that you're keeping that in mind and checking in as you develop things on the material side. Yeah, I totally agree. I think a lot of bioprinting papers, viability is it's kind of a red herring because you can have cells be immensely unhappy for an extended period of time and they won't be able to do anything. Right. Um, so you, you kind of really can't proceed forward. Um, but Waihan, do you have any, any thoughts? Yeah, actually, my suggestion is quite similar to more. It's, I mean, my background is more like a material side, but mm-hmm. I mean, during the whole uh, experimental process, or during the whole time, I have a feeling that if you want to print something with cells, if you want to create a biological tissue, then it's, it's always more important to uh, be careful about your cells. I mean, like, it has been shown that pranic, for example, it has been shown that pranic has no cytot- or very low cytotoxicity. But however, we just cannot make it work without stem cells. And I mean, they're just not happy with that kind of material. So I would say when you are planning to develop uh, or when you are planning to change your printing process or something like that, always think about your cells first. They are the major role of this. Yeah, I think... Uh... What, what you're kind of hinting at is if you are a, a young student and you're reading uh, papers of what other people have done, they might not have all been doing the right thing. Where uh, pleuronic is immensely common to make vascular channels, but at the end of the day, it's a surfactant that can immensely damage your cells at, once it's being washed out. So, um, yeah, definitely some some good advice. Um, I think those are, are both like tremendous pieces of advice uh, to end on. I think that was uh, fantastic. Really, really thank you guys for your time. It's always fascinating to see people doing fresh and bioprinting um, and expanding uh, the knowledge of just tissue engineering as a whole. So, so thank you so much for being able to join us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah. All right, thanks. Thanks for watching this research highlight. We hope you found it useful. Leave a like or a comment below so that other researchers can find research and work like this. Thanks.